In this video, we're going to take a look at the basic theory of radiative transitions, which involve the emission or absorption of light. And so to begin, let's remind ourselves about the classical picture of light and what a classical description of the absorption of a photon by a molecule might look like. So classically, light is an oscillating electromagnetic wave. And so if we were to chart the electric field associated with a light wave through space, it would look something like a sine wave like this. And as that electric field oscillates up and down in the vicinity of a molecule containing electrons, which are themselves negatively charged, the field will cause the electrons to oscillate up and down. And this, of course, imbues the electrons with energy, right, as they are pushed up and down in an oscillatory way. Quantum mechanically, this results in some probability for a transition from a lower energy level to a higher energy level. And we'll see why the oscillation promotes the possibility of a transition when we talk about the transition dipole, which is the for first important concept of this video. When we bring quantum mechanics into the picture, this classical picture breaks down to some extent because things like the symmetry of the orbitals involved and other quantum mechanical factors can lead to diminished or even in some cases increased probability of a transition relative to the classical model or increased strength of a transition, we might say. And that is quantified by the oscillator strength, the second important concept of, of this video and, and the basic theory of radiative transitions. So classically, when the electrons oscillate up and down in interaction with the electromagnetic wave associated with the light, a dipole moment is created. We can imagine that there's a dipole moment, for example, pointing in this direction when the electrons are spending most of their time up here as a result of being pushed by the light wave. The extent of that dipole moment for the transition is called the transition dipole moment, and it's given the Greek letter mu. When the transition dipole moment is equal to zero, the transition is forbidden. And here again, there may be weak structural perturbations or interactions that enable mu and then to have a very small value, those we would call weakly allowed, but at zero order, we can calculate in a relatively rough way the transition dipole moment. And if it is equal to zero, that transition is forbidden. So the transition dipole moment is, is calculated very similarly to any dipole moment. We take the charge of an electron, the elementary charge E, and we multiply by the distance of the electron from an arbitrary reference point. There's one of each of these terms for each electron in the molecule to give the overall transition dipole moment. For a typical excitation, of course, we're only interested in those electrons whose orbital configurations are changing in the course of the transition. We can think of this as a quantum mechanical operator on the initial electronic state, psi n, and calculate the transition dipole moment for a particular transition by operating on the initial state and projecting onto the final state, figuring out how much final state character is imbued by the injection of a transition dipole essentially onto the initial state. And this diagram from Wikipedia does a really nice job of showing this idea visually how oscillation in a classical sense of electrons in a molecule gives the electrons some character of a final higher energy state. At the top here, we have an initial quantum state that looks like this. This is the probability of observing the electron at a particular point in space. It's most likely to be right here at the origin. And on the left, you're seeing the time dependence with the real part of the wave function in blue and the imaginary part in red here. In the second row, we have a hypothetical higher energy final state. We know it's higher energy because there's a new node in the wave function that is at the origin. And if we look at the time dependence, we can see the oscillations are somewhat faster than they are in the psi zero state. So psi one is higher in energy than psi zero. Now, watch what happens when we construct a superposition of psi zero and psi one, essentially by adding them together. When we do that, the probability of observing the electron changes with time. And so you can see that there's an oscillatory probability here where at any given moment in time, the electron is sometimes more likely to be on the right and sometimes more likely to be on the left, and it appears to be moving back and forth. There is a dynamic oscillation going on for the electron in this picture. 
And after all, this is exactly what interaction with an electromagnetic wave causes. Oscillation of electrons back and forth. That oscillation results in a quantum state that is a superposition of the initial and final states. And the closer the frequency of light is to the natural frequency associated with the energy difference between psi zero and psi one, the more likely the transition is and the greater the character of psi one in this superimposed state. Likewise, the greater the transition dipole moment, the greater the extent of the oscillations here, the more likely is the transition to the final or higher n state here, psi one. In the notation over here, it's psi n. So the transition dipole moment then gives us a quantitative measure of the probability of a transition and the extent to which oscillation of an electric field coming into contact with the molecule causes a dipole moment. Using the concept of transition dipole moment, we can understand electronically forbidden transitions that involve no net overlap of psi m and psi n. And we've actually already seen this as a selection rule, but transition dipole moment gives us an idea, a little bit deeper idea of why it comes to pass. So the end of pi star transition in formaldehyde is a nice example of this, where there's zero net overlap and the transition dipole moment operator does nothing to change that. So I'll briefly here remind us of this picture of formaldehyde that shows the n and pi star orbitals at right angles to one another. Because these orbitals are orthogonal and have no net overlap, no oscillating electromagnetic wave can create a superposition of the wave functions because they're orthogonal to one another. And again, the, the transition dipole moment operator does nothing to change that. So if we try to calculate, for example, the transition dipole moment associated with the transition from the ground state to an n pi star state, which we might de uh, denote like this, let's call the ground state the S0 state, this is going to be zero, and this means that this transition is forbidden. Now the other case where a transition is forbidden and the transition dipole moment is really needed to see that has to do with light that is perpendicularly polarized with respect to a transition. Transitions require the motion of electrons in a particular direction in many cases, and a nice example of that, that is pi pi star transitions in a molecule like benzene. In order for an electronic transition to be promoted in benzene, the incident light has to be polarized the right way. It has to be polarized in the molecular plane so that oscillations of the electrons in that plane can take place. And so I'm going to draw the light wave kind of at an angle to denote this. Imagine the benzene molecular plane and the plane of the light are coincident. They're coplanar. The oscillations are happening in the molecular plane of the benzene ring. This gets electrons moving back and forth across the ring, which is going to promote electronic transitions from pi to pi star, for example. And so the transition dipole moment here will be greater than zero for parallel polarized light, we might say, light that is polarized in the plane of the molecule. However, if we hit benzene with perpendicularly polarized light, now imagine the plane of this light wave is perpendicular to the molecular plane. Well, all this does is move electrons above and below the plane of the benzene ring. And after all, they're already above and below the plane of the benzene ring in pi-type orbitals that are symmetric with respect to the molecular plane, right? And so this does nothing to alter the fundamental electron distribution in a molecule like benzene. It does nothing to alter the dipole moment. So there is no transition dipole. And perpendicularly polarized light, when it interacts with benzene, causes essentially zero electron displacement and no observable transition. In the classical model, recall that we said that the idea of light is that it gets electrons oscillating. And we can think of those oscillating electrons in a classical excited state as an example of a classical harmonic oscillator right, with motions up and down, very similar to the vibrational situation, the electron moving up and down in a harmonic potential as a result of the light that is impinging on it. That happens with some strength, some amplitude, we might say. And quantum excited states may or may not have that same amplitude of oscillation due to various restrictions on the strength, likelihood, probability of a quantum transition. So it's no coincidence that this letter F matches the F we used for prohibition factors in a previous video, because the smaller F is the prohibition factor, the smaller is what we call the oscillator strength the relative strength of the transition relative to the classical harmonic oscillator model that we put forward here. 
oscillator strength can actually be measured because it's related to the size and width of a peak for a transition in an absorption spectrum. There is an equation for this. The key point here is that the oscillator strength is related to the frequency of the transition. This is the frequency in units of wave numbers and the transition dipole moment. The greater both are, the greater is the oscillator strength. And the oscillator strength is a dimensionless value because it's essentially a ratio of the strength of the transition relative to the strength of a classical harmonic oscillator transition. Looking at an absorption spectrum, now this is our first look at an absorption spectrum in this course, so let's kind of orient ourselves to what we're looking at here. We have the frequency of the transition on the y-axis in wave numbers increasing to the right. This is often increasing to the left in practice. And we have the molar absorptivity or the absorption coefficient on the y-axis. And this is essentially how strongly the substance absorbs at whatever frequency or, or wavelength on the x-axis in units of per molarity per length. We can integrate under a peak to obtain this value A. Essentially, we're just integrating the green space you see right here. And the oscillator strength is related to this integral via this equation right here. So again, we have essentially a conversion factor right here, theoretical conversion factor, simply times the area under the curve. So the greater this area, the stronger the oscillator strength. If the integration is difficult to perform, we can approximate this using the maximum absorption coefficient. That's going to be the value of epsilon right here and the width of the transition at, at half maximum. Essentially what we're doing here is we're taking this curve, turning it into a rectangle and finding the area of that rectangle. Here the FWHM stands for full width half maximum, the full width of the peak at half of the maximum absorption coefficient value. All of these equations allow you to do some pretty cool things. If we know what the absorption spectrum is, which is extremely common, we can calculate oscillator strengths easily. If we know or have a rough theoretical idea of what the oscillator strength is, and we know the frequency, we can calculate things like the transition dipole moment, how long in terms of distance the electrons are displaced in the course of the transition, and various things like this, because we can relate F and new bar back to the transition dipole moment. So for example, if we plug back in these values, F equals one and new bar equals 40,000 inverse centimeters, which is a typical number of wave numbers for an electronic transition, we calculate a transition dipole moment for this hypothetical transition of about 7.3 Debye. And F equals one, by the way, is a nice benchmark, right? Because this tells us kind of the, the classical harmonic oscillator model what should we expect for the transition dipole moment and for the distance displaced? If we consider now that we've got a dipole moment value and all we have to do to find the distance displaced is just divide by the charge, we can calculate the average displacement of the electrons in the course of this transition. And this ends up being about 1.3 angstroms. So that's, that's a pretty sizable dipole moment um, if you kind of put this in context for the classical harmonic oscillator. So many oscillator strengths are, are often less than one. They can be greater than one in some cases. But this gives you kind of a nice benchmark for what's the classical model say? Well, roughly about one angstrom of displacement of the electrons on average, and a generated dipole moment of about 7.3 divi is typical. And although I didn't show the details here, I encourage you to plug in these numbers into this equation and verify for yourself that yes, in fact, the transition dipole moment needs to be 7.3 to buy to make this work out, and the resulting average displacement of the electrons is then 1.3 angstroms.